Amen. How many are ready for the word of the Lord today? Are you excited? Amen. Remember, we're excited to share with you a powerful word today. I want to talk to you about the thought, what will you do when your water dries up? What will you do when your water dries up? We've been dealing with a, a spirit of fear and a spirit of lack. I think that the first wave of COVID, people had to deal with this spirit of fear. A spirit, is there going to be enough? You know, so first of all, people run off and start grabbing things. You know, if certain items are getting sold right away. We see milk taking off, and then we see bread, and we see meat, and then we see non-perishable foods, and then we see toilet paper and paper goods, and then we see uh, sanitizer and cleaning supplies. I mean, what was driving all the hoarding, what was driving all the people going and buying it all up was fear, right? Fear that there's not going to be enough, a fear of lack. We don't know how long we're going to be locked down. We don't know how long we're going to have to be in isolation. Will there be enough? And so fear drives us. And then we move into the second wave of fear. And now I think that's kind of where we're at. You know, second wave of fear. Are people going to see my gray hair? Will they please open up my beauty shop, right? Yeah, I know. And we start moving past that, getting our hair done again, and we start relaxing. But then there's this next wave of fear. You know, it's kind of like a lack. Not a lack of things, but a lack of patience. We started getting impatient now. We have a lack of being positive. We have a lack of an endurance. We want to give up and just quit. You know, we have uh, uh, just a fear. Will my business survive? Will my job survive? Will I be laid off? Will I find employment again? Uh, will my business have to close? All these things start happening, and it causes fear to come in and grip us, and we know that it brings extra stress and anxiety, a place where God has never wanted us to live. So I, I want you to write this down. Even when things run out, God has not run out on you. Let me say again, even when things start to run out, it doesn't mean that God has run out on you. It just means he's got a different plan. Something's about to change. See, you have to handle this fear and redirect it in the right direction. And I'm not going to be without. You got to look at your neighbor and say, I'm not going to be without. Come on, tell them and say, I'm not going to be without. God's got this. God's got me. God's got you. We're going to be okay. I want to talk to you about this story, the story of the prophet Elijah. It's a great story. I think it really fits the timing of where we're at today. And we're going to pick up the story. And first of all, Israel is in a three-year drought. And God has sent the prophet Elijah. Remember, he was running in fear from Jezebel who wanted to kill him. And so he's running in fear. And then he sends him. He goes, go hang out here by the brook. And I'm going to bring the ravens of the fields. They're going to bring you and feed you every day. How many think that's room service right there? I mean, you talk about being so favored to God. He's sitting back chilling, and God's sending him ravens to just bring him food. I mean, long before there was Uber, we had the ravens, okay? And so he, he, ravens are bringing him food. He goes, I'm going to put you by this brook, and this brook is going to stay there. And the brook continued to have supply, even though they were in a three-year drought, no rain for three years. Crops are dying. There's not enough food. There's not enough water. He was still taken care of. But again, things begin to change. He's in lockdown, okay? Let's just say he was in lockdown for three, days, three years, okay? We're upset about three months. He's been in lockdown for three years. And then things begin to dry up. That's what it says in verse 7 of verse 17. 1 Kings 7, 17. But after a while, the brook dried up. It always does, doesn't it? And there was no rainfall anywhere in the land. So can you imagine this? It wasn't like he just woke up one day and the water was not there. This brook dries up slowly. It gets lower and lower and lower. The stream starts flowing slower and slower, and then eventually it stops flowing. And then eventually it's just a few puddles here and here, and then eventually it's all dried up. And so can you imagine what Elijah was probably thinking in his mind, like, what's next? What's going to happen next, God? You've been taking care of me, but now what? Now what? There's a drought, three years. Now what? You know, and, and it's, things can happen, and I want you to see this and understand it, that God was not rejecting Elijah. He was only redirecting Elijah. He had a different place that he was going to meet his need. He had a different place he wanted to go. He had something else he was trying to work out in his life and bless not only him, but be a blessing to somebody else. So God was redirecting his life. 
See, look at this statement. I want you to get it down. We need to stop looking at the brook drying up in our lives as rejection and start looking at it as redirection. Redirection. God's redirecting us. It's, it's a thing that God's do. Oftentimes, the place of our source of our income changes, and God's got a redirection he wants to do in our life. Look at verse 8. It says, Then the Lord said to Elijah, Go, okay, leave this place. I know you've been here for three years. I've been taking care of you, but now I want you to leave. Go and live in a village of Zarephath. There's a city of Sidon, and I have instructed a widow there to feed you. And so God is now saying, I'm still going to feed you. I'm just changing your locations. See, you don't have to panic when the water dries up. You don't have to panic when things are start not working the way you think they should. It's been three years I've had a steady income. It's been three years I've had this certain way happening, and now it's changing. I don't have to panic. God is just going to redirect my life. So how do I do this? Number one, write this down. you got to be open to God's new thing. Be open to God's new thing. In the midst of change, great things can happen. In the midst of the water drying up, great things can happen. I love this verse, and I think it really speaks strongly to you and I today in Isaiah. Isaiah 43, 19, God says, for I am about to do something new. Let's say that. God says, I'm about to do something new. See? Can you see it? He goes, can you see it? I have already begun. Do you not see it? I will make a pathway through the wilderness, and I will create rivers in the dry wasteland. See, what's happening now, I may be walking through a time of wilderness, but God's already bringing a pathway toward me. I can't see the pathway there, but if I can see beyond where I'm at right now, God's already plowing a pathway toward me. God's already making a new thing happening. God's already making a new direction. God's already making new things going in my life. See, God is wanting something to happen. Don't give up now in the wilderness. Listen, it's going to get tough. Don't give up on your business now. Don't give up on your marriage now. Don't give up on your families now. Don't give up when it gets hard because God can create all things new. God can take things and heal them and bring them through. God says, even when it seems dry, like there's no way, I can make a way. I can make a way. Don't give up on your children. God can make a way. Don't give up on your finances. God can make a way. I'm telling you, God is there working when we don't see it. And you got to know that. You got to believe that. Don't give up. He says, I make the pathways in the wilderness. I bring the river in the dry places. I never thought that we'd be in this place. I never thought we'd have to close the doors for a couple of months. And I'll be honest with you. Then we first closed the doors of the church. I was upset. I was very upset. I didn't like it. I know you didn't either. I didn't like it because I was like, man, all I could think of was things lost. All I could see was things lost. And I was thinking, man, we had one of the greatest starts to the year we've ever had. We were growing as fast as we've ever grown in the history of Destiny Church. We're seeing things happen, people's lives being changed, great momentum. And then we have to stop. I'm like, no, you know, I don't want to stop. But why? Because all I could see at the time was what was lost. All I could see what was lost. And shortly after that, God began to deal with my heart and said, listen, quit whining. I'm like, okay, God. You ever, you ever had that time? God said, quit whining. I'm bigger than that. It's okay. And I was like, all right, God. God said, I want you to begin to do what you can do. Deal with what you can deal today. Basically this, get good at what you can do right now. And so we had the equipment. We hadn't used it yet. We were just getting ready. Thank God we had the foresight in our leadership to purchase. We had brand new Supermax coming our way. They were here. We had new cameras and equipment. We've been doing wire work behind the scenes that you didn't know about, getting ready to do a live broadcast. And we were just like a week or two away from starting that process. And all of a sudden, we're starting, okay? And so we, we had all the equipment. Thank God we had it because if we hadn't purchased it when we did, it was six months back order now. You can't get it. It was a run on all that equipment. So thank God we had the foresight to get that in. And so we had that in, and we just said simply this. We're going to jump in, and we're going to get 
good at doing what we're doing, and we're going to just improve every week. And every week, we try to get a little bit better, and a little bit better, and a little bit better, and learn more, and experience more. And pretty soon, we begin to build it up. And what was amazing was this. We would go back and look and find out that we were having, some weeks, we were having over 10,000 people around the world watching our broadcast. We would never have that on a Sunday morning here. We would never experience that here. But because of technology and what was happening, God was taking the gospel. And we have people writing us from different states and different countries. We had, I had a, a, a group of missionaries that I, I did help in Pakistan. And I, I meet with their leadership team every so often. And I Skype in with them and pray with them and, and do devotions with them. And they, they contacted me and said, hey, we have Pakistan TV Christian Network that we, we want to put destiny on. Is it okay if we get rights? to your broadcast. Oh, by the way, we have over 100 countries that watch our broadcast. So all of a sudden, we're packaging this for you when you're at home, and then we got people in Pakistan calling us saying, can we put this on and have 100 countries watch? You tell me God is not up to something when we don't see it. See, if I just focus on what I'm losing, I don't see what we're gaining. I don't see what God's, all right, God, you're trying to do something new. God, you're trying to redirect. All of a sudden, you're looking out for the neighbor. All of a sudden, you're calling people you haven't called. All of a sudden, you're knocking on doors you haven't knocked on. Are you okay? Can I do anything for you? Do you need anything? We're, all of a sudden, we're looking out for each other. Isn't that what we should be doing anyway, right? All of a sudden, we're texting each other. We're encouraging each other. Uh, it, it's, it's what came out of that. Get your eyes off what you're losing and put your eyes on what you're gaining. You see, God, throughout the history of Scripture, teaches us he does new things. He says, I want to give you a new heart. He gives us a new spirit. He goes, I'll make you a new creation. I'll give you a new life, a new family. He goes, I will give you a new love. I will give you a new hope. I'll give you a new name. I'll give you a new covenant. I'll give you a new way of thinking. I'll give you a new strength, a new purpose, a new future. I'll give you a new home. He goes, my mercies are new every single morning. My mercies are new to you and I. I'm telling you, our God is the God of new. We've got to embrace it, okay? We've got to embrace it. I don't live in fear when the water dries up. I don't live in fear because God is trying to redirect. I know how many people I know in my life have said, if my job hadn't have quit, I'd have still been working here. But thank God that I got fired. Or thank God I got laid off. Or thank God that that business didn't happen. And it led me to something else, which I'm much happier now doing. You see, I've got to look at his redirection. I love that show, Shark Tank. You ever watch that show? I love that show. It's a, one of my favorite shows. And I love hearing the stories. And so many of them say, they say, how'd you get started? And I'll tell you, probably over half the people in there say the same thing. Well, I got laid off my job. Or I lost my job. And I decided I wanted to do something. And so we went all in trying to figure this new thing out. And I was thinking, man, isn't that happens? You know, so many times we won't make a change unless our old things begin to dry up. And it forces us but think out of the box. It forces us to say, all right, God, what next? And God's like, it's exactly, that's what I want you to be. Asking me, what's next? So I want you to do number two. I want you to look ahead with faith. Look ahead with faith. See, God wants to do something new, and I look ahead with faith. God instructs Elijah, go to this town, side on, but time out. If we look back, we know this, that the Bible says that side on was the hometown of Jezebel. So God is asking Elijah, all right, I've been taking care of you over here. You've been, you've been getting Uber every day. You've been getting the drinks every day. And now I want you to go back and go back to where Jezebel's at. I mean, he had to go back and face his biggest fear. Why? Because God had another plan. God had something he wanted to do. And so it was important for him to go back and to face his fears. And he does this, and it'd have been nice. He said, I want you to go find this widow. And I was thinking, you know, it'd have been so much more nice if this widow would have been rich, right? I mean, that'd have been the dream thing, you know? Come on, just, just speaking from my own flesh. But if I was in Elijah's shoes, it'd have been nice if the widow was rich. But she wasn't. She was broke. She was broken. Look what the scripture says in verse 12. 
He asked her, he says, now go get me something to drink and make me something to eat. And look at her response. But she said, I, I swear by the Lord your God that I don't have a single piece of bread in the house. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug. I was just gathering a few sticks to cook my last meal. And then my son and I will die. See, this woman, she hadn't ran out of food. She had ran out of hope. She had no hope. What she couldn't see was this, that God had sent an answer. God was sending provision. God was sending the man of God there who was going to open the door of provision for her and her son. But her first mindset was, nah, we're done. We're going to die. We're down to, that's it. We're going to die. See, when you lose hope, when you lose hope, you're not living. You're dying. That's where it's at. You got to have hope. God, I'm hopeful that God, even though the stream is drying up, even though my provision is drying up, God, you've got another plan. You've got another way. My faith is in you. I'm looking ahead. All right, God, that just means you got a different way. God just means you got a different plan. You see, our past pain really affects us, doesn't it? And I was thinking about this the other day. I was thinking about how when we put our sunglasses on, come on, turn to your somebody and say, I wear my sunglasses at night. Come on now. I be wearing my, I wear my sunglasses. And when we wear our sunglasses, what it is, it's a filter, right? It's a filter. My sunglasses filter out the sun and it causes me to see differently. And I wonder how many of us put on the filter every day of our life with hurt. I've been hurt before, and so when I look out now, everybody's going to hurt me. This person's going to hurt me. This person's going to also do me wrong. I'm never going to see things get better. I'm only going to see betrayal. I'm only going to see rejection. And when we look through our life this way, that's all we see. What we experienced in our past, that's what we see coming in our future. Well, this is what happened in my past, so that's what's going to happen in my future. And we don't even realize it, but we, we've taken away all hope. We've taken away all hope, and we're walking around. But see, when I put on my glasses, my glasses magnify things so I can see much clearer. And I've got to learn to put on the glasses of the Holy Spirit and say, God, I see your promises waiting on me. Yes, I see the water's drying up. But God, you've never left me. You've never forsaken me. And God, you've got provision waiting for me and my family. God, you've got provision waiting. And God, things will get better. God, you can bring things back to life. Things that were dead. God, you can cause those things to come back to life again. God, you can sustain me. God, you can, I got to see and anticipate that. What glasses are you wearing? Are you wearing the glasses? It's never going to get better. It's over. It's finished. Or are you putting on the glasses? You know what? There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. Put on the glasses and say, God, I want to see. You see, look at this. I, I love this. I want you to write number three. Ask for enough today. Ask for enough today. See, Elijah asked her to feed him first. And it wasn't a test about food. It was a test about faith. Do you believe if you do what I'm telling you God wants you to do, do you believe God will take care of you? It was a test of faith. Look what it says in verse 15 and 16. She did as Elijah said, and she and Elijah and her family continued to eat for many days. See, many days. There was always, to say that word together, there was always enough flour and olive oil left in the containers, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Now stop today. Don't, don't miss this. Don't miss the miracle of enough. Don't miss the miracle of enough. How many times has God been enough? How many times has God done enough? I look back over the years and I say, God, I don't know how I raised five kids. I don't know how we got them fed. I don't know how we got the bills paid. I don't know how we made a few vacations we did. I don't know how we did it. You ever been there? I was like, look back, oh, man, there were some really tough times. I don't know how we made it through all those medical bills. I don't know how we made it through all these procedures. I don't know. We did. 
And it's all I could look back to God, you were always enough. You were always enough. See, we, we, like, we like that pressed down, shaking together, running over blessing, don't we? We like that more exceedingly, abundantly. And there's nothing wrong with that. That's how our God wants us to think and dream and believe. But don't miss out on the God of enough. Listen to me. Before, look at this statement. Before God will give you the land of plenty, he must establish that he's the God of enough. And think about it. The children of Israel, they had to go through this. They went and God was taking them to the promised land. And the Bible says that they said about the promised land, it was a land of plenty. It had all the milk and all the honey. And they said the fruit was ginormous. I mean, they're like, man, this place has plenty of things for us. It was a land of plenty. He was taking them to the land of plenty. But every day he brought them manna. And the manna was only there that morning. They would get it that morning. It was enough to last them that day. And then if it was left over, it was spoiled before the next day. And so every day, they had to get up and trust that God was going to bring the manna to them to eat. See, he was taking them to the land of plenty. But he was trying to teach them he was the God of enough. And so for many of us, we got to establish that in our life. Don't miss out that he's the God of enough. He's got enough for us today. He is enough for us today. He's got enough grace for me today. He's got enough joy for me today. He's got enough peace for me today. He's got enough for my marriage today. He's got enough for my family today. He's got enough for my finances today. He's got enough for my business today. Listen, God is one enough. He's the God of enough, and he has not left you. He may be redirecting you. He may be changing your focus, but he is still with you. You are still favored of the Lord. You are still still walking in the blessing of the Lord. Just pick up your head. Look unto the hills. Say, God, I'm looking to you through my valley. And God, I know that you are bringing me through. Realize that he is the God of enough. What do you have need of today? He's enough. What's your biggest request today to the Lord? He's the God of enough. Today is your day. If you hear, say, Pastor, I, I need to surrender my life to Jesus Christ. That's the first decision, is I make a way that Jesus Christ becomes my Lord and my Savior. And so right now, wherever you're, you're, you're at, I want you to just bow your heads with, you, with me. Whether you're watching online or you're here in the auditorium, if you're here or listening to me today and you want to give your life to Jesus, just raise your hand where you're at. Even if you're online or in the auditorium, raise it and say, that's me. I'm ready to surrender my life to Jesus. Thank you. Anybody else? You're ready. Yeah, thank you. This is what we're going to do. I want you to repeat this prayer after me if you raise your hand. Say it with me. Say, dear Jesus, forgive me my sins. I surrender all of my life to you. I believe you are the Messiah, God's only son. And from this day forward, I will live for you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, come on, give God a hand clap. We appreciate you very much for making that prayer. Now listen, you need to be plugged into a church family. Find a church home. Get plugged in. Learn what it means to become part of the body of Christ.